Tonight we have a, a, an amazing guy. He's done some wonderful things. He was Microsoft for years, 22 years to be exact. Uh, I've played basketball with this guy for years, uh, received many elbows. Um, <laughs> wonderful. Well, I always okay. apologized. He always apologized. That's <laughs> very true. He did always apologize. Um, but yeah, so I, I want to welcome uh, a guy that's doing some great work in both the community, and both here and abroad. Uh, so without any further ado, Robbie Bach. Where do you want me? Here. This is all you, my friend. So, let's see, is my mic on? Oh, we're using this one, okay. So that's the first time I've had a standing ovation. Yes, that's always good. Yeah. Especially so after somebody's discussed my basketball skills. That, <laughs> that, that, that never happened before. <laughs> well, obviously, I didn't tell the truth. <laughs> yeah. So, so, again, for those of you who have not been to one of our events, it, it really is a conversation, conversation between two humans, uh, Robbie and myself tonight, and we're going we're gonna to chat for uh, 45, 50 minutes, and then we'll open up for Q&A for 15, 20. So hold your questions. Feel free to get up. Go back and get a glass of wine or beer if we have anything left. Don't feel like you're going to interrupt us. Just feel like we to do that. Restrooms are on the, on the back, and if any questions, go ahead. So, um, Robbie, I have a list of questions. Some of them are interesting, some of them maybe not so. Uh, and really, this is about what you've done, some things that you, you know, maybe wish you hadn't done. Um, Oh, that, that's a longer list. Yes. We may need more than 45 yeah. minutes for that. Yeah. That sounds like a Kin Zoon set of questions. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, I got some, I have some questions just that, that I, some people actually have said, hey, you know, I really want to know that, right? That, sure. that kind of information. So, when you were at Microsoft, which was in 98, or 88, right? You started right. in 88. Yep. Um, Tell us what it was like to be at Microsoft in 88, say 88, 89, and 90. What was the culture? Where was that? Yeah, uh, so when I started Microsoft, there were about plus or minus 3,000 employees. Yeah. My badge number was 03671, so that meant there'd been 3,671 employees before me. Some of them had obviously left. So I think there's about 3,000 employees. Sure. We were in five and a half buildings in the original five and a half building all, in the trees. All 3,000? Yeah, well, okay. some of those were salespeople okay. and, and international subsidiaries and things like that. But, um, so the place was actually really small. And, you know, you got to know uh, a lot of people. And, you know, the engineers and the marketing, everybody sat next to each other. I mean, there just wasn't, <laughs> and you, they, we were doubled up in every office. I, my first office I shared with Karen Freeze and we were in a storeroom closet. Nice. And we had no windows, and when we shut the door, we were in the closet, and yeah. you know, that was the way you worked. <laughs> um, so it was a very, it had a very startup, uh, kind of get things done atmosphere. And truthfully, that didn't change really for a long time. I mean, even as the company got bigger, they sort of had, atom each group sort of had atomic units. Yeah. And the company didn't, um, the company developed multiple cultures. So you, you know, as we got as we got bigger, you know, you, you'd end up in a group that had a culture which felt like its own small group, and it didn't feel like the company had fifteen thousand people. Um, and you know, and eventually at some point you get 40,000 people, and you start yeah, yeah. to you start to feel the change. But um, that took a long time. That was another actually another question was like the first what was it like the first ten years? Yeah. And what was it like like the last five or eight years? Yeah. So last five or eight years, just so you know, he, he uh, left Microsoft in 2010. Right. So, uh, you know, four or five years ago he left. But so like say from 2004 through 2010, how was that different from say 88 through 98? Well, so the big, I, I'd say the biggest thing is that the company would, by the time we got to 2004, 2005, the company's in so many different businesses. I mean, it was hard to talk about Microsoft as Microsoft because, you know, we were in, small, medium, and large enterprise businesses. We were, you know, increasingly in cloud service businesses. You know, we had uh, operations in, I don't know, 90 countries or some crazy thing. Yeah. So at that point, it, it frankly felt a little bit more like multiple companies, which was, um, you know, good in the sense that you could feel a part of the group you were in. But because the company wanted to do things cross-group, it made doing things cross-group really hard. 
Um, different groups had different objectives, had different customer sets. Um, you know, people were trying to share technology, but that was hard because people had, had yeah. different agendas for how to use the technology. And so when we started in those first 10 years or so, it was a crazy place because things were always changing. So it had that sort of topsy-turvy feel of, okay, what's the strategy today? Today it's OS2, tomorrow it's Windows. The next day it's OS2, the next day it's <laughs> you know, Windows yeah. again. Um, you know, today languages matter, tomorrow they don't, then they matter again. I mean, it was just a lot of churn and change, just like there is in companies like that. Yeah. And later on, there was less of that churn and change, but the challenges were more organizational. And, um, and how do you get things done? In both cases, it's actually hard to get things done, but for completely different reasons. Different reasons. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I'm, I, I liked both, actually. I, I always tell people, always ask me, do you miss Microsoft? And I always tell people, no, I don't miss Microsoft, but I don't feel like I was there. I felt like every month I was there, I enjoyed. And so I, I kind of feel like I left at the right time for me. And, but the, the enjoyment was different depending on the period of time I was there. Uh, sure. And you just had to, and you know, if you wanted to be there for 22 years, you had to find different ways to learn <laughs> and enjoy what you were doing, because it just yeah. wasn't the same. Yeah, well, and, and obviously, I mean, different leaders, Right, I mean, you worked obviously with Steve a lot. And, yep, yeah, I worked and, for Steve yeah. for seven years. Yeah, um, and obviously worked with him and with Bill for for a, for a long, long time. time. And and they were different leaders. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> say at least. Um, so let's talk about the reputation of Microsoft in a startup environment. Yeah. So um, <laughs> it's not. I mean, so if I took a survey of the people in this room, how many people are from Microsoft in this room? Yeah. Oh, that's more than, more than normal. Um, so when, if I asked 20 people that weren't at Microsoft what they, and they were in a startup, yeah. uh, they probably wouldn't have a very positive opinion of Microsoft. Right. So why do you think that is? Well, I, I think there's a... Uh, how do, how do I say this? There was a period of time in which people, whether they were in small companies or large companies, were frustrated with Microsoft just because the company was big and because we were, cons we were considered a little bit of a bully. Sure. But people still respected the company and wanted to work with its technology. And so it was just funny. It's a little bit the way people feel about Apple today in the sense that there's this love-hate relationship with Apple because they're actually kind of a pain in the ass to deal with in a lot of things. Technically, yeah. But they're actually, people like working with their technology and they have a lot of customer attention. So people, people uh, consider them, you know, somebody who's at the cutting edge of what's going on. And so for the longest time, the challenge with Microsoft was, well, you know, they're kind of hard to work with, but they have real relevance. They're doing some cool things. And so I want to be engaged in that ecosystem. And once the ecosystem stuff started to be more challenging, so now the benefits of putting up with the, yeah, with the pain do. went away, sure. it got more challenging to, to figure out, okay, so why do I want to work with them? And then outside of the enterprise space, which is very different, if you were in the consumer space, then people started to say, well, why is Microsoft relevant? PCs are less relevant. Yeah. They don't do a great job in phones. They're not, you know, they don't monetize through search as well as they should. And Xbox is sort of a different business, so you know we had good partners there, but it's a completely different business. So you know they, they kind of said, well, why do I care? Now, if you actually went and talked to enterprise people who are doing enterprise work, you know Microsoft still has relevance there, um, partly because they buy a lot of companies, so they end up being a an exit ramp for people, um, partly because their technology gets used, and the company still has a huge customer base there. And that's the thing that to me in that 20 year period changed a lot. When we were you know, working with Office, I worked in Office from 92 to 97. That was a consumer product at that point, even in businesses, right? Because the IT guy wasn't buying the product. Sure. And now Office is an IT product, um, by and large, even though yeah. consumers use it. And so that's a big change. And I think that's you know, left the type of people who want to work with Microsoft in, in different spaces. So if, if you, now let's just, let's change this. So now you're the, now the, the CEO of Microsoft and you now are tasked with how do I make <laughs> Microsoft, how do I make Microsoft more startup friendly? How um, you, how, Robbie, how do you solve that? How do you, or what do you think you, you would do? Well, oh gosh. It, 
Uh, that's probably a much longer conversation and way above my pay grade. And since I don't get, nobody pays you don't, me. No one pays you. Nobody so pays me anything. Everything's above your pay grade. So yeah. it's above my pay grade. The, the thing I would say is, at, yeah, at some level, you have to get back to, uh, in a way, some of the core things the company did historically, which was the company had real relevance in tools. It had yep. real relevance in APIs. It had real relevance in things that supported other people making money. And even if you didn't always love Microsoft, people made money by being connected to what Microsoft was doing. And so the question you have to ask today is, how does Microsoft enable opportunity for startups? Forget whether people love Microsoft or don't love Microsoft and all that kind of stuff, and whether it's a friendly company or not friendly company. In the end, you know, people care about, is the ecosystem, are there dollars in the ecosystem? And so the question you have to answer is, what does Microsoft need to do to put dollars in the ecosystem for startup companies? And there's things they are doing. That's why on the enterprise side, there are dollars in the ecosystem for startup companies. Mm -hmm. Not only because Microsoft buys those companies, but also because they enable opportunities with larger corporations. And building on, because Microsoft's established in those companies, building on Microsoft technology can be advantageous and can create opportunities and create an ecosystem for you. Yeah. In the consumer space, you know, that ecosystem just isn't there as much. And you know, there's a lot of activity in this consumer space. It's what gets most of the press attention. The enterprise stuff gets almost no press attention. Yeah. So when you, when you talk about the broad media, people say, well, Microsoft's not relevant. And that's because they're looking at the consumer space, where <laughs> Microsoft today doesn't create as much economic opportunity for the startups, for, for startups in the, on the consumer side of the business. Yeah. So to me, that's what I would look at. And that has lots of different meanings. There's a tools question. There's an API set question. There's um, um, you know, a search relevance question, clearly. Sure. There's, there's a bunch of other things that you'd have to address to get at that. But the fundamental question is, how do you help people make more money? Yeah. yeah. And it's why people are on Android. It's why people are at work with, with Apple. Not because they love Google or Apple or even necessarily all the technology, but it's because there's dollars there. Yeah, it's a platform. It's a platform. Yeah. So tell us, what the heck do you do now? Like, what do you do? What's your day? What do you? What? My uh, my uh, my life is split into kind of three parts. Um, so there's a part which I started right when I left Microsoft, which I'm I'm pretty involved in a number of boards. Uh, three of those are sort of for-profit boards. Four of them are non-profit boards. Sure. Um, and so that, think of that as consulting work. And I'm yeah. not. My board work is not go to four board meetings a year. I'm pretty involved with all the places that I, that I work with. Yeah. Um, so that's Sonos. Um, it's actually Brooks, the running shoe company. Sure. Uh, locally here in Seattle, Space Needle, which is actually a for-profit, uh, really cool business, very interesting business. And then the nonprofits, Boys and Girls Clubs, uh, US Olympic Committee, and an organization Europe. called Year Up, yeah. which cool. is a really cool um, uh, organization. They have a Seattle branch, but based in Boston. So there's about a third of my time is board work. There's incre an increasing amount of my time, probably 40% now, is on what I call civic engineering. So one of the commitments I made when I left Microsoft is that I wanted to, you know, for my first 25 years of professional life were about business success. I wanted to have social impact in what I was doing for the next, uh, the second act of my life. Um, so I've written a book that's about what I call civic engineering. And civic engineering is just, how do we do a better job enabling civic organizations to do things in a better way? How do we enable, I was talking to somebody earlier, how do we enable ourselves not to build a bridge that isn't funded to go any place when we get to the other side? Which is in fact what we're doing in Seattle today. Um, how do we help um, the education system get better? Not super relevant topic right now in the state of Washington and my home, original home state of North Carolina. Yeah. Um, so the book is about, the book's called Xbox Revisited, it's a game plan for corporate and civic renewal. And, and just, just so you know, the book's not available yet, so it, don't it, go to Amazon try to buy don't it. Don't go to f try to find <laughs> it, it'll be, it'll be available at the end of June. It's not there yet. <laughs> um, but it, it basically takes some lessons we learned on Xbox from a strategy perspective and applies them to civic issues. And I do a bunch of public speaking on that topic, I do a lot of lecturing at universities, I've been teaching a course in public policy at the University of North Carolina this last semester. So that's 40%. Yeah. And then the last sort of 25% and growing a bit, um, some of you got, most people in this room may know Pete Higgins. Um, Pete's a good friend of mine. He hired me into Microsoft. My first interview with a Microsoft employee was with Pete, Pete Higgins. Higgins. Yeah. 
Um, and Pete <laughs> and I bought a uh, gluten-free flour and fresh pasta company in Kent <laughs> called Manini's, um, which is you know a really small company. It's a startup, or it's a restart up. It's probably a more uh, yeah, a better way a yeah. better way to say it. But you know we sell in Whole Foods, we sell in PCC and Metropolitan Market. Product is amazing. Um, and the business wasn't being run super well, and so Pete and I are doing some work to try to cool. help fix that. So I've got, I got my hands in a few different places. Yeah, that's good. So over the last, say, uh, okay, so you've been working for Microsoft four and a half years. Right. right. Uh, over the last three years, what have, what's been the thing you learned? What's like, what was the big thing that you learned over the last couple years, two, three years? Um, and don't give us the crappy answer. Give us a real answer. No. <laughs> well, now I have to think. Okay, so I got to get rid of all my crappy <laughs> answers. So that's good. I have to think of something good. Um, you know, I think I think the biggest thing you learn is you learn. I, I I can look at my 20 plus years at Microsoft, actually pretty objectively, um, which has been really refreshing. How long did it take you to look objectively at it? Uh, uh, probably about 18 months to two years. That's not bad. And the writing helped because I was writing about it. Sure. And as you're writing, you know, the writing can't be bullshit, yeah. right? I mean, it's got to be real, yeah. and people have to know it's real. And so, you you have to you have to objectively step back and say, okay, things I did well, things I did poorly, and you know, as a result of that, I think I'm a better board member today than I would have been when I was at Microsoft because I know things I did badly there and I can help sure. people see the things that they're doing badly that are equivalent. And you know, I have sort of a, a renewed ability to sort of look at things objectively and say, well, my first instinct is to do that and that's the way I did things for 22 years and that wasn't the right way to do it. I mean, I, I'll give you a small example. So um, I'm a, I was a big believer in people, which I think is a good thing. And I hired, uh, people who I thought were smart and could grow. Um, some of them were non-traditional Microsoft hires. We kind of had to do that in the Xbox business because traditional Microsoft hires wouldn't always work in some of the things we had to do. And some of those people struggled at Microsoft their first period of time and part of my task was helping them get fit, fit in and get in at Microsoft. And so I developed a habit of basically having patient, more patience with people than I probably should have. And a number of those people were super successful, so I'm glad I had the patience. And you still have to do that. When you hire people in a difficult situation, you have to develop them. But you also have to know when to cut bait. And I just wasn't very good at that. Yeah. And you know, so now as I watch, um, A, watch some people who are better at it, evaluate some of the decisions I made about people at Microsoft that I would do differently, I can say, OK, you know, that's that's a, a real learning, something yeah. where I could say, hey, if I was a CEO today, I'd be a little tougher. And you know, I mean, even in, this, in the silly little context of Menini's, you know, we've had to look and say, okay. This guy's not working. That guy's not working. Yeah. And as much as, we're, you know, as much as part of our goal is to employ people and build a business and, and you know, be an engine for growth, you know, sometimes you got the right, wrong person and you have to, have yeah. to move on. Yeah, so, so. And it's particularly relevant for this audience, because in a startup, you just you can't futz around. <laughs> right? there's, just no, there's just no margin for error. Yeah. And at Xbox, you know, nominally, we had too many margins for error because the company was willing to fund us. Yeah. Hey, that's a good question. So how long did it take Microsoft to make money at Xbox? Uh, <laughs> well, so just, so, so just to, get, no, to get the numbers, the, the numbers clear. Yeah. Um, if you looked on an annual operating basis, uh, six years. Six years. Now, that meant we, but. That's including all the R&D? Yeah, yeah, I mean, we started, we started Xbox basically 2000. And we would have made money on an operating basis probably in 2006, maybe 2007. Yeah. So somewhere in that range. But basically we had to flush the first product. Yeah. The first product was a massive money loser. We lost. Depending on how you do the accounting on shared resources. <laughs> Who are you to? <laughs> it, it, well, no, it's mostly a question about shared resources. Yeah. Um, somewhere between five and seven billion dollars, yeah. which, when you think about it, is just a you know a staggering amount of money. But the second version probably made, and I haven't done the math on this, but probably made three or four billion dollars. 
And then when, by the time you add to that the asset value you built in the second version, which is probably worth another, yeah. you know, five, six, seven billion dollars, who knows? And, you know, today's multiples, you know, who knows? Yeah. Um, uh, you'd say, well, okay, so that was successful. But it's, it's not a typical way to think about investing in a business and building something great. Yeah. Because the company had a big strategic agenda and a lot on the line and wasn't willing to, to, to lose. Yeah. And, and so the, the effort it took to you know, navigate, I yeah. guess, navigate the, the waters at Microsoft. Yeah. Um, do you miss some of that adrenaline? Um, no, which I know <laughs> is an answer people don't believe. Um, what, I, what I've discovered is my adrenaline rush, I'm a person, and, I, and I'm, a, I'm, by, I'm in the dictionary next to type A. Yeah, yeah totally. <laughs> and I'm, I'm really competitive. And so for me, having something that challenges me and excites me is a requirement. But I don't miss the, that in the context of Microsoft. Yeah. Uh, I've replaced that with other things that really get me energized, really get me excited. Um, I've discovered I love to write. So not just a book, but blog posts and a bunch of other things. And so I've, and you know, speaking, I like to speak. So I get, you know, if I'm doing a speech with five, 600 people, I do a lot of preparation work. I want it to be great. Yeah. And I get, I get jazzed about that. And you know, after I give a speech, it takes me two or three hours to calm down. I mean, it's like a sporting event. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so I've replaced the buzz that I got from the things we did at Microsoft with other things that matter to me personally, and that's, that's super exciting. I do think for some people who leave, finding the thing that fills that void is important. You know, it's like a professional athlete. It's like yeah, watching Michael Jordan retire was yeah. painful, right? Because the guy yeah. just didn't know what to do. Yeah. And he cared about the buzz. Yeah. And it was a buzz kill when he, when he retired. And so he kept coming back. Yeah. And, you know, so you have to find things that you're committed to and motivated to, to pursue. Yeah. And are you, are, are there things, you know, if, again, for this audience mm. being startup driven, right? Are there things that you are coaching, you know, like in your, sure. in your, in your talks and things that would, that would easily equate to what many of these people in this room are looking at somewhat on a daily basis? That, like talk about the three P's yeah. and, and how they Yeah, the, the, the biggest thing, I mean, my, most of my speaking, if you, get, if you get really down to what my book's about and what I do in speaking, it's about this thing I call the three P framework, which to be, to be accurate is something that, uh, for those of you who know Jay Allard, um, Jay was uh, my partner in crime on Xbox. He's the guy without which um, Xbox would not have happened. And... Jay had a, an approach to thinking about strategy that was interesting. We worked on that over the time we were there together. From that came a bunch of thinking that I've now kind of crystallized into this 3P framework. And basically, what it says is if you want to build a strategy, you have to say, you have to be able to say in three pages what the purpose of your business in this case is, the five principles, up to five principles under which you're going to operate as an organization and as a group, and up to five priorities. And you got to be able to write that in three pages. And if you can't do that successfully, so purpose is one sentence with a paragraph maybe that explains it. Um, a good uh, purpose example, so Sonos, if you asked a Sonos employee, what's the purpose of Sonos? They would tell you some permutation of all the world's music in every room in your house. It's a very clear statement of what they're trying to accomplish. And interestingly, almost every employee there could tell you some permutation of that statement. That's what they're about. At Microsoft, it would have been in the early days, you know, a computer on every desk and in every home running Microsoft software. And part of the problem for the company happened around 2000 when that wasn't a driving mission anymore. Yeah. And so what was the purpose of Microsoft? In fact, it had multiple purposes because it was actually in some ways multiple businesses. So purpose is really key. Principles. Running Xbox for the first five years was a nightmare. Just a nightmare for me personally. <laughs> yeah. It's just the hardest thing I've ever done by a factor of five. And it's because it was the United Nations with no core principles. 
And I ran it about as well as the Secretary General is able to run the United Nations. <laughs> Just really hard. And until we established principles under which we were going to work and come together as a team, we couldn't make progress. Yeah. And that's a phase that people miss. Sometimes it happens organically, sure. but often it doesn't. And then priorities is just the simple thing that it's easy to try to do 10 things. And I promise you, you'll never do more than five at once. No organization will ever do more than five at once. And the problem is if you have a list of 10 and they do five, you don't know whether it's numbers one through five or number six through 10. And when it's number six, six through 10, the company fails. Yeah. And so really getting disciplined and forcing yourself to write that down and do it. It's incredibly hard. And we did it for the second version of Xbox. And I do it with a bunch of the companies I work with and the nonprofits I work with. And it's amazing how clarifying it is for people. Um, and it's not rocket science. There's no scholarly research on it. When you, when you think about it, it's actually stupidly obvious. Yeah. And yet yeah. <laughs> people skip it. Sure. You have an idea and you suddenly you're writing code. Yeah, which is normally the case. Which is normally the case. And suddenly you get, you know, six months in and you realize you've written the wrong code. Holy shit, this doesn't work. This doesn't work. Yeah. Uh, why doesn't it work? Well, because it's not actually achieving what we started to achieve. Yeah. Right? And yeah. you go back to score, uh, core principles. Yeah. And so priorities now, so you talk a little bit about priorities. Priorities yeah. now, where are your, what, do you, what are your priorities? Like, what's priority number one right now? Um... Well, if you want to talk, you want to talk personally, or you want to talk professionally, because there's... I, well, uh, yeah, I'm going to assume that your family's probably priority number one on, your, on the personal side. Yeah, so, crazy. yeah, exactly, yeah. yeah. But, uh, um, but so from a professional thing. perspective, priority number one is the work I'm doing on civic engineering. Okay. Um, no question. And, you know, if Pete was here, I'd say that, and he would nod his head knowing that that was, ex in fact, yeah. true, even though Manini's is, you know, I'm going to be at Costco and Renton, Saturday afternoon demoing Manini's if anybody's interested. <laughs> um, so you'll see me in a hairnet and a hat. It's not a good look. Awesome. Um, so that's on the priority. That's on the priority list. God, I love that. Yeah, it's not. It's a really bad. It's a really bad visual. Um, it, that's on the priority list. But if you ask me, what do I care about? What's number one on my list? Yeah. It's. Uh, this is going to sound really corny and old-fashioned. I'm a really patriotic person who cares about the country a lot. You know, when I, was in, when I was in high school and early in college, I wanted to be a U.S. Senator. Now, I don't want to be a U.S. Senator anymore for lots of reasons, but I want things to be better. Yeah. And I want my generation to feel like when, we, when we're done, the country's a better place. And unfortunately right now, my generation is on track to make the country a worse place. And for the first time in American history, the generation of people following us are going to have a worse environment to live and work in than when we started. And that's a bad thing. Um, so the challenge I have in that priority is figuring out how to have impact yeah. and how to build scale. And that's why the book and the speaking are so important to me because those are one to many forms of communication that can enable me to have scale given the fact that I don't even have an assistant. So I mean, I, I do my own scheduling. So yeah. having scale matters and that's why the book and speaking are, are you know, first and foremost. Yeah. And so what have you learned um, in your speaking that you thought you knew? Yeah. But then turned out like, eh, I don't think I actually knew that. What would it be like? Because you, you've done obviously a number of talks. You've, you've been in front of you know, a few thousand people over the last you know, couple of years. Yeah. What, what thing did you learn from those few thousand people? That, like, I thought I knew this. Actually, I didn't. Um, well, let me tell you what I learned, what I, what I suspected was true, was told was true, and now I absolutely positively can <laughs> confirm is it true. is true. It is true. Okay. So it's sort of a reverse way of answering your question. But that's what you're supposed to do in PR Q&A, yes. so sort of yeah, twist yeah. the question in a way that you can answer it. Um, so there's a, a woman who some of you may know named uh, Tina Chen, um, who was an ex used to work at Microsoft, left Microsoft. She's written five books. She's a fabulous fiction author. Came back to Microsoft to be my speechwriter for the last two and a half years I was there. And she told me that the power of speaking was all about telling stories. And that the way to pull at an audience and capture an audience was to take 
personal, professional stories sure. and make them relevant to what you do. And so my speeches went from being PowerPoint text slides to being all visual images with n almost no words on them. And Tina would literally interview me for you know, an hour at a time to just dig out stories from my past. Yeah. And then when we were having a topic or a speech, the stories would then come back to play a role in the speech. And uh, what I've discovered, and so that was effective, but I've discovered it's really effective. powerfully yeah. effective. And when you're willing to share of yourself in a way that doesn't feel natural and is a bit uncomfortable, um, it's even more powerful. You know, so you know, I'm writing in my book, and I'm writing about you know, the fact that three months before Xbox shipped, I tried to resign. You write about the fact that, you know, when I was, you know, 13, I had a back problem that changed my life in fundamental ways. And you can talk about every speech I give, almost to a to a fault, talks about faith, perseverance, and serendipity, three things I really believe in. Sure. And I talk about all those in the context of stories. And um, I think of myself as a pretty good speaker. I've done, gosh. Thousands of speeches. Yeah. And. Um, really? Yeah, oh, yeah. I'm just kidding. Easy. <laughs> Easy. <laughs> and I thought of myself as a pretty good speaker. And Tina made me better, and I've gotten better still since. And storytelling is at the heart of that. Yeah. And it's easy to have sort of a analytic approach to a presentation. Here's our positioning for the product. This is what it does. This is how it works. And people walk out of the room and maybe they remember it, maybe they don't. And when you can tell a story around that and explain it to people, they'll remember the story way better than anything you said and way better than the PowerPoint slides you put up. And they'll connect that story to the thing you want them to remember. And it's, uh, I, you know, I think it's magic. Yeah. And um, I probably sort of suspected that and now I completely believe it. Yeah, that's a good learning that, that uh, when you're younger, uh, I learned this 20 years ago, that if you can't tell the story, no one's going to remember what you said. Yeah, it's, it's funny. If you, if you actually think about the people who you think are you know, great speakers, and you actually, um, well, some people are great because their technique is really good. They're engaging personalities and they, you know, they'll tell a joke and they, you know, they, they have a technique for being speaker. But oftentimes you'll walk away from that speech and you'll say, well, that was a great speech. And two days later, you can't remember anything from, from the, speech. the speech. And, you know, so that person's a great uh, artist, a great performer, but in my mind, not a great communicator. And so the speeches to me that are powerful, uh, I watched uh, Condoleezza Rice came to give a speech at the US Olympic Committee. And three weeks after the speech, I could re-give the speech because she talked about stories. Yeah. And because she did a great job framing each point she wanted to make had a story behind it. Yeah. That was powerful. So one of the things that as entrepreneurs that we, we learn, which you, you learn over time, is that when we're doing investor pitches, that there has to be a story. It cannot be facts. and and PowerPoint slides. There's got to be a story in there, and you have to create that story as entrepreneurs. And many, 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 many times, it's your personal story because it's your product, and you create it because there's some weird thing that happened to you, and, and you you want to fix it, right? But yeah, or or it's yeah. A, or it's a customer story. Yeah. You know, or it's the scenario and the story around what's going to happen with your product that's going to change the way people think about things. I mean, if you think about some big successes, you think about you know, how would you describe what Uber is? Eh, you know, okay, so I can go through technically and say it's this app which makes it easy to order a taxi, blah, blah, sure. blah. But the, story, the stories I can tell about yeah. Uber are way more effective than the actual description of what it does. Because when I can say, you know, this is gonna sound silly, but my daughter has a job in a bad part of Boston. I don't worry about my daughter's safety. 
and that maybe not 100% true in Uber's case, so maybe I have to <laughs> rethink that a bit. But it's way it's a way better environment, and I can talk about that. Yeah. And you know, I can think of the scenarios. You could, there's so many scenarios where you can find a pain point that people appreciate and have experienced themselves, and tell the story around how you're going to solve that pain point. They will never forget that. And that's way different than the bullet points on a PowerPoint slide. Yeah, yeah. And that's actually how you get people to write your checks. Exactly. <laughs> totally right. Um, let's talk about some things in just kind of general technology industry stuff. Sure. So what, what, what are you tracking right now? What, what things are interesting you from a technology standpoint? Like what industries are you looking at? What, you know, what are you kind of reading more on than less? Um, I think there's a couple interesting things going on in the business world that are interesting topics anyway. Um, I spent a lot of time in the music industry because of my involvement in Sonos. Yeah. The music world is about to go completely, is going to change. I mean, as much as it's changed in the last three or four years, it's going to change dramatically in the next four or five years. Um, and that to me is a fascinating process of watching you know, old school labels deal with new school technology companies, some of which are established like Apple, some of which are startups uh, like Spotify and Pandora. Um, and even those are now big companies. Sure. So there's other startups that are, you know, having an impact in that space. Um, you have got an artist community there, which is interacting. So you've got talent interacting with what are basically legal teams at the, at sure. the labels. I mean, they're basically yeah. lawyers. So you've got talent people, you've got lawyers, you've got technology folks, um, you've got, it's a consumer business, and uh, it is just the most fascinating place. And then the technical parts of it are, absolute, are, are really very cool. Yeah. So when I watch what Sonos does with speakers and software, I mean, for a company that makes money selling hardware, they're an incredible software company. Yeah. Most important part of what they do in many respects. And they're doing some really exciting, cool things. So to me, that whole industry is a microcosm for what's happening in Internet of Things, um, the resurgence of hardware mattering, um, yeah. the intersection between content, uh, talent, and technology, which I think is a really cool uh, triangle. So talk more about that. Well, so, uh, so take a song, take your average song. So what's, what's involved in an average song? Well, it turns out that you have to divide a song into at least three parts. So there's the lyrics. So somebody wrote the song, which turns out in most cases actually isn't the person who sings the song. Yeah. So they have an economic interest in what happens with the song. Then there's somebody who wrote the music. Sure. Yeah who has an economic interest and oftentimes isn't the person who wrote the words or the person who sings the song. Sometimes those are all the same, but sometimes they're not. Yeah. Then you have the person who actually sings the song. And then all of that gets wrapped up and parsed out to guys who manage the rights for the song and who in theory do marketing for the song, but in fact actually don't do very much marketing. So the late, there's the publishing houses who manage the the music and the words. There's the labels who, are, in theory, do the marketing and the distribution. Um, all of those things are old school things. And so that's just the content part of it. Yeah, yeah. So then you got the technology part. So take somebody like Beats. Well, they turn every song into a bass display. So in fact, the song you hear when you have Beats headsets on it's isn't what the artist even intended. It's different. Yeah. It's different. And, and their customers like that. They sell a lot of headset, headphones. Okay, fine, but you know, if I'm an artist, you know, now something's different. So now you've got the artist and the technology guys in sort of this funky space. And then you take somebody like, uh, like Sonos, who's looking at, who doesn't actually have any relationship with labels. They have relationships with Spotify and Pandora and those guys, but they have no economic interest, um, no direct economic interest in the value of the music, yeah. they sell stuff that people use to listen to the music. Sure. And so they've got a whole nother angle on it. And they're looking at materials, design. I mean, they've got a whole nother 
perspective on this thing. And when those three things collide in one space, it's, I mean, it's fascinating. Yeah. To me, it's, uh, it's cool, and it's changing in radical ways. So that's one thing I would, and there's, the same thing's happening in video, just different set of players. Sure. But the same thing, I mean, video, in some ways, is more interesting because there's more going on, but the change is gonna be a little slower because the Luddites have more power. And so um, <laughs> the music industry got taken out at the knees by Apple uh, yeah. to some degree, you know, 10 years ago. And so the established folks have less power, so the change is gonna happen faster. That hadn't happened in the video space. And so the change there is slowly, but you know, Netflix is now a content company. Who would have thunk that? They were a mail order DVD company. Yeah, they're producing their own content. And they're producing their own content. So, you know, so that same thing's gonna happen in that space. And, you know, this is just part of what happens in innovation where people look at existing industries and they tear them apart and they get rebuilt. And sometimes the old players survive, sometimes they don't. Yeah. And in the music space, I mean, where's all the money made music today? Actually live performing. You know, uh, you know, so artists, if you really want to make money in the music space, you have to be great live. And you have to be able to attract an audience. That's where the money is. Yeah. And you know, 15 years ago it was in, D in CDs. Completely changed. Yeah. The other thing I will say that I'll just comment on in the tech space, which is a personal source of frustration. And, um, and I, I don't, I'm not close to this issue. But I think in some ways the VC world is a little screwed up. Um, and I don't, comp I don't, I'm not an expert on this. Um, I'm not a venture capitalist. I'm not an angel investor. Um, I, but I interact with the space in indirect ways. Yeah. And I, unfortunately, I think the guys who have, mo unfortunately, A, there's way too much capital, which is sort of ironic. All right, there's way too much capital, and a lot of it's not going to the right places, which is you know, also sort of, sort of strange. But there's way too much capital. And what that's led to is the big guys who have the most capital have to figure out how to generate big returns yeah. on big numbers. So they have to write big checks. So they write big checks. And the only way to make that work is to sustain, sustain valuations that may or may not make economic sense. And, and so there's this, there's this sort of subculture within the VC community of people supporting each other's deals. You got a lot of big guys who are in on the same deals. It's the old boys club. And it is. And, and it's an old boys club, and that's a, a related but additional problem. <laughs> Right, which is if you're a, a female entrepreneur, the market's not a level playing field today. Yeah. That's just true. Sad. I think it's wrong. Yeah. It's horrible. But you know, independent of what happened in the suit in California, whether 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 that suit was, let's say, it was judged correctly based on the facts, the underlying issue is absolutely real. Yeah. And so, to me, there's something uncapitalistic, um, and I am definitely a capitalist, there's something uncapitalistic about the way the venture community generally works. And that's not true for all firms. I have uh -huh. a bunch of people who are in the VC business who are great people, who do really good work, and try to find great companies, support entrepreneurs, are committed, they stick with businesses for a long time, they try to participate in boards in ways that aren't just about their return, but that are about making companies successful. So I don't want to paint too broad a brush, but to me, there's some rot in the system. And, yeah. and you know, again, I'm not being precise enough because I'm not close enough to it. But I see it and feel it in some of the things I do. Yeah. And you know, that's to me is, you know, I think this part of the US economy is the heartbeat of the economy right now and, and should be for the next 20 or 30 years. And if there's rot there, we got to figure it out and fix it. Yeah, yeah I mean, the funds Many, 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 many jobs. Um, so what industries do you think, you know, you briefly touched on things being a little bloated. Yeah. What industry, or maybe there's industries, what are those that you think are too bloated and we get the valuations too crazy? Well, I mean, you know, at some level, it's, it's the obvious things that are the buzzwords of the day. Yeah. So the Internet of Things is real. Not every Internet of Things is going to be real. Yes, yes. Right, so... The, you know, the, the valuations for companies who are Internet of Things related that have no business model are, overbl are, are overblown. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm a, I'm, I, my undergraduate degree is in economics. Yes, yeah, so right? you're 
Yeah, so I'm a fundamentalist. Yeah. Why I'm, this is why I'm not an angel investor. <laughs> right? I'm, I'm a, I'm a, I believe in the fundamentals, yeah. and in a bunch of things, the fundamentals just aren't there. Yeah. Now, the Internet of Things is real, and there will be people who do amazing things there, and sure. there'll be big money there. But not everything deserves the valuation that people give. So some of the same thing's true on the enterprise side in the cloud. So everybody says, well, I've got a cloud foobar, therefore it must be worth a lot of money. money. Yeah. The cloud is an amazing place, but it's not nirvana, right? There's bad businesses in the cloud. And bad things happen in the cloud just like they do on premise. Sure. And, you know, so I, I do think, you know, our, our, one of the challenges in the venture community, which is just sort of part of the game, is that things get on a hot run and when you have too much capital chasing too few things, gets the stuff that's hot gets overblown and money goes to the wrong places. Yeah. And we're, you know, somewhere in the next two or three years, we're headed for a correction. It just, it's it just, it's, it's going to happen. Yeah. And, um, you know, part of the, the challenge in the VC community is, um, you know, there might be some folks who are big who are going to get caught in the correction, yeah. and how's that going to work out? Yeah, it's a, it's a, that's a real challenge. Yeah, yeah. Uh, guys, questions. Feel free to start raising your hand and uh, ask questions as you as you feel free. Um, so, one thing about the industries that are, you know, having a lot of attention, right? Sure. So, when they have a lot of attention, what do you think? Um, because here, here's what happens. So Robbie has a cool company, uh, and then Seton has a cool company, Joe and Bill have a cool company, and all of them have a SaaS model, and these are all getting funded. Sure. And then I go, like, oh, shit, okay, well, there's a SaaS model. I can have a SaaS model, too. Exactly. So I'm going to turn my company <laughs> into a SaaS model. Right. Um, how do you, how do you uh, where does that fit in the, you know, the capitaliz capitalism startup world? How do you feel about that? Is that something that you say, I, well, you know, it's just part of the game, it's just how it works, or it's like, you know, it's like, come up with your own idea, or well, look, how do you feel about let's, that? Let's, let's distinguish between two different things. Um, not, everybody doesn't have to come up with a new business model. Everybody doesn't have to come up with a new SaaS, yeah. right? So software as a service is a real thing. And if you have an idea where software as a service is a powerful benefit to customers, God bless, do a SaaS model. That's what you should do. Sure. Right? The problem is when people want to do a model that doesn't have a benefit for customers but sounds good to get money that they can raise. That's when the problem happens. And then suddenly you have something that's masquerading as a, just to pick SaaS as an example, it's masquerading as a SaaS business. When it's really. When it's really not, or doesn't need to be, or shouldn't be, or the customer doesn't benefit from that. And SaaS becomes the elevator word that gets them a meeting to have a chance at, sure. you know, getting money. And you know that's a you know that's that's a classic problem, right? Buzzwords are buzzwords. You know, it, it's it's funny. We would have Xbox Live. We would have never described that as a cloud service, never in a million years. It's probably Microsoft's first cloud service. Yeah. Why would you describe it as cloud? Why wouldn't I? Yeah. Well, we, the cloud didn't exist. We well, didn't I'm just branding-wise. I'm just, wise, out, I'm just I'm yeah. pointing out branding-wise, we yeah. would have never thought of it that way. But if you were doing Xbox Live from scratch today, you would say, oh, it's, it's a cloud. gaming cloud service. Sure. And how many guys have been trying to get funding as gaming cloud services? A bunch of them, right? Not because necessarily that's a better experience. Yeah. See, uh, what was it? Uh, on live or on, there's a bunch, there's a bunch of guys who just died because they were gonna to try to stream games from the cloud because cloud was a big deal. Well, it turns out streaming games from the cloud is really hard and it's not a great customer benefit and yeah. once those companies fail. Well, eventually somebody will make that successful. But that's the point. I mean, you gotta, in the end, all of these things have to come back to, um, I have a customer, what benefit am I delivering to that customer? And if SaaS or cloud or mobile supports that, then I can say I'm one of those guys. Yeah. And if it doesn't, I gotta say I'm something else. Yeah. And I, I gotta find out what that is and, and how to stick. articulate that in a way that captures people's attention. Yeah, stick with it. And, 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 and stick with the benefit. I, you know, it, um, if you have a compelling consumer benefit, 
you will find a way to monetize it. And if you don't have a compelling consumer benefit, or a consumer could be an enterprise, but a compelling customer benefit, um, if you don't have that, no amount of buzzwords and re-engineering and re-architecting will, will ever get you there. Yeah. And I, I know that sounds completely obvious and completely silly to say and completely um, goofy, but the number of things I see where you kind of go, really? Really? <laughs> How's that going to work? Yeah. Uh, yeah. That happens a lot. Sure. Uh, question. So, uh, it's 2008. <laughs> It's 2000, I'm just repeating the question. It's yeah. 2008, what went wrong with Windows Mobile? Oh, 2008 is too late. <laughs> <laughs> Windows Mobile was broken in 2004 or 2003, if we're honest with ourselves. Okay. Um, in 2007, 2008, we made it worse. I can take credit for that. So I'm, I'm happy to raise my hand and say, I didn't fix the situation fast enough, but yeah, but what, yeah, okay, but here's what happened. Um, we lost sight, and actually, if we're honest with ourselves, this is true for Windows, too. We lost sight of the customer benefit and who the customer was. And the customer for Windows Mobile was the OEM or the service provider, AT&T, Verizon, et cetera. So we would do anything we could in Windows Mobile to satisfy some demand from HTC, Samsung, and at the time in 2003 there were about eight other guys, and from AT&T and Verizon and Deutsche Telekom and some other guy. And what, you know, in 2007 we did something like 50 releases of Windows Mobile operating systems. Because everybody had their own screen size and they had their own touch technology and they had their own <laughs> widget and their own this and their own that. And not because there was any particular customer benefit for that, but because that's what they thought of as their differentiation. And in fact, what Apple did, which was very smart and very effective, is they said, we're going to produce a great phone. And we're going to tell the operators, tough luck, you don't get to tell us what's in the phone. <laughs> and we're going to tell, we're going to do the hardware ourselves, so, and we're going to integrate software and hardware together. And we're going to make a great customer experience. Windows mobile phones were never, if we're really honest, and I, I can say this, I ran the group, were never a great customer experience. They were great at points in 2003, 2004, great for the time. They were good relative to what else you could do at that time. But they were never great. And I, with due respect to people who worked on that business, they did really good work. I'm not really trying, I'm, I'm really not trying to slam anybody. And I, like I said, I managed it for, for three years, so I can, I can take some, yeah. some credit and blame for this. But the experience was never, hey, wow, as a phone. As a PDA, we did some really cool things. But when it went from being a PDA to a phone, it was sort of a PDA masquerading as a phone. And the phone part was never great. We dropped calls. Reception was never really good. The interaction with the screen, the touch stuff we did required a stylus, and even then it wasn't very good. They were expensive phones. They were kind of bulky. And we didn't figure out the importance of integrated design and customer benefit soon enough. And when I took over the business, we were working on the same path. I let the team work on that path for a year, one of my bigger mistakes and we didn't switch our model for 12 months. And in that 12 months, uh, Apple shipped an iPhone, Android came to market, <laughs> and the market moved in the blink yeah, of an eye. Yes. And we went from 20 million units of Windows Mobile to three in the space of 12 months. And you know the damage in that happened long before that. Yeah. Um, the other thing I will say about Windows Mobile in defense of the Windows Mobile team it was never resourced to be successful. And ironically, one of the things that really hurt it was Longhorn and Vista. Because a lot of technical talent went to fix those products. Technical talent that could have been on other things. And that was a problem at the company. I mean, if we're, if we're honest with ourselves as Microsoft employees, um, when those products went sideways, people had to fix them. That was, a cornerstone of the company, so it had to be fixed. So the best technical talent went there. 
and there wasn't enough technical talent to go around. That's how I see it. I, it may not make people, everybody super happy, but that's the way <laughs> I, again, in my, new, in my newfound mode of being able to be objective, that's the way I would, uh, that's the way I would call it. And you're not getting the paychecks, you don't really have to worry about it. Yeah, exactly. Well, the, the, the hard part about this is, as much as I, I've been at Microsoft for five years, I can now, I don't say we anymore, um, but I still love the company. I think it's a great company. It's an amazing company. They're still doing really great work. So it's always tough to be critical, but sure. you've got to be honest about yeah, yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. In the, uh, against furthest right. Yeah, so right, the, yeah. Two, two, yeah. two fingers in the air, go ahead. Yeah, so uh, you spend a lot of time at Xbox. Do you see eSports sticking around for a while or coming to the North American market? Sorry, who? eSports, electronic sports, video game competitions. Um, I'm not an expert on that. I don't know enough about what they do. You know, the funny thing is I don't follow the video game space as close as I used to, so I'm not, I'm not gonna give you a good opinion. I do think there is, um, there is plenty of opportunity in performance type things. Let me just say it that way. There's plenty of opportunity where people, because of what's happened in the cloud, and because of the, the ability to create virtual gatherings, there's plenty of opportunities for things to happen in that space. Specifics, not gonna be my, my strong suit. Uh, but lots, there's, there's lots of opportunity there. And I do think you're gonna see more types of competition um, build there. That's why Xbox Live was an interesting experiment because it's sort of the precursor of enabling those kinds of things to happen. All the way back, red shirt. That's you. Um, so let me repeat that. Right. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so, question is, what Azure can do to compete with AWS, right? Uh, yeah, and Google. Oh, and Google Docs, sure, sure. Um, so, what I would tell you is, I think right now, um, that competition is an AWS Azure competition mostly. I mean, Google Docs is there in a certain part of the marketplace, but it's. Um, I, I would tell you that. Most of the companies I talk to are making decisions between AWS and Azure. Yeah. And to me, the number one thing is what I said earlier. How do you get a platform that people make money on? Sure. And how can you create an environment where people are doing cool applications in the cloud, new things, not just moving stuff that exists in the premise into the cloud. This is not about necessarily exchange on Azure. It's about new things that happen in the cloud and who's gonna develop for those. And you know, frankly, Amazon has a, has a head start there because a lot of the cutting edge work is done, was done on AWS. There's a bunch of people who uh, were first in the cloud who used AWS, so there's a track record there. And that now needs to, you know, for Microsoft to be successful, they've got to um, catch up on that front. And I actually think they're making progress there. And I'm not a big diagnostician about what's going on in that space. It's not sure. my specialty. But um, I do think it's a place, you know, Microsoft's always been a fast follower in, in some respects. This is a place where they're following actually sooner than usual. <laughs> Um, if I can say it that way. And usually Microsoft <laughs> a little further behind. Get, gets a little further behind and then has to work really, really hard to catch up and sometimes we never catch up like at, at happened in the mobile space uh, over the last four or five years. But in, uh, in the cloud space, we were there relatively early and you know, I think that's gonna be a two, maybe Google will be a third horse in that race, but that's gonna be a long you know, five, 10 year battle uh, for sure and I think it'll be good for customers and for businesses that there's two guys there who are credible. Let's go down. Blue shirt. So Xbox revisited. Yeah. You learn everything in game, not everything, I'm sorry. You learn a lot in gaming. Yep. And you have a passion for civics. Mm. So it's 2020 presidential election, Ronnie mm -hmm. Locke for president. <laughs> what are your, take your three people off of here. Yeah. What are your three priorities that you would do on your so you'll, you'll laugh at this. Um, when you read the book, one of the things I do in the book is I write a three-page paper for the United States. So I write a purpose which I steal completely word for word from the Constitution. So 
It's, not, it's actually not a great purpose statement. The preamble of the Constitution is actually a poorly written purpose statement by my definition, but it's what we work with, right? The purpose statement was written, and it's there. And so I dissect that and talk about that. I write five principles for how I think the country should work and think about things, and then I have five priorities. Um, and so those five, I'll just tell you what the, since you asked, I'll tell you what the five priorities are. Um, there's an, e there's a business, an economic business model problem that the country has that we have to fix. And um, the, the way we think about revenue and expenses is just screwed up at every level. Our tax system's a mess. Um, we don't really understand how we spend money. There's no accountability for how we spend money. There's places where we should be spending more. There's places where we should be spending less, and there isn't a good way to manage that. So there's an e what I think of as a business model problem at the core. Second thing is our education system um, needs dramatic work, and that's really hard because it's a highly distributed system. So fixing the education system isn't even something that's going to predominantly happen at the federal level. Most of it has to happen at the state and local level. Federal government can help, but a lot of it has to happen at the state and local level. Um, that's a big issue in the state of Washington. As I said, it's a big issue in the state of North Carolina, where I also have a lot of uh, family and interests, and those, unfortunately, are two of the states at the bottom of the education stack right now. Um, third thing is energy and the environment. Um, if we don't figure out how to have a long-term uh, environmentally uh, sustainable energy uh, ability to produce energy, not only is going to cripple uh, developed economies, but actually the people who get hurt the most are the people who are in undeveloped economies um, because it takes away their ability to develop. And uh, so there's a huge mandate. That's a long-term problem. It's not an immediate problem, but there's a huge mandate to deal with the environmental mess we're creating and to produce energy. Um, that's part of it. Fourth one is our safety net. Um, isn't a net. It's got holes in it. Um, it's bad. Um, the government part of it, nobody's willing to talk about. Um, government leaders aren't willing to talk about Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, or any kind of safety net problem. It's considered off limits. Um, I think the government needs to spend a lot of money there, maybe even more than it spends today. But nobody wants to talk about what we spend or how we spend it. And when you can't talk about you know, 45% of the budget, and then you add defense, because you can't talk about that either, you now can't talk about 75% of the budget, there's no way to fix things. And so thinking through our safety net and how public, private partnerships and government activity together could improve the safety net in our country is a, is a huge deal. And then the final thing is uh, inter our international policy um, is you know, follow the ping pong ball all over the place and there's no logic or strategy to it generally. And that's a big problem. And six, seven, and eight are huge problems. You know, that's the, the challenge of writing those five is I can have a really engaging debate with you and you could convince me that what I have at six should be five. Yeah. Uh, because the things that are at six, seven, eight, our election system is a disaster. Um, actually, the issue of race in, the, in America is a huge problem and is, is a disaster of a different type than it was in the 60s, but equally, equally messy. Um, so, you know, I can, get to, I can get to 10 things really quick. And the reason I did what I did in the book is because you've got to pick five. And we can have a great argument about which five to pick, and what I wish would happen is that the country would have that argument. Here's the test. I'm going to write a blog post about this at some point soon. Here's the test. When you're figuring out who to vote for president, find out which candidate can tell you five things that are their top five priorities and not change them when they go to the next meeting. Yeah. <laughs> so we're not voting, exactly. But that's precisely the problem. Yes. That is precisely the problem. And until we, until we face that problem, and until citizens stand up and say, we're not going to put up with that, until people demand change on that front, things are not going to get better. Um, so anyway, that's a, it's a good question. You played right into the book. Thank you for the marketing opportunity. Yeah, exactly. uh, much appreciated. Okay. Let's go down here. Hi, Robbie. Um, I totally agree. Great company. That's one. So I have a three-prong question. Sure. <laughs> you only get one how prong. Did one first prong? Uh, how did you generate the Xbox culture within an enterprise behemoth? 
And what was the genesis? Because I know it was not the type of culture that would generate a sort of a, a sort of a, I would say, a spin-off or whatever sure. you, you want to call it. Okay, that's the first one. That second one, do you recommend a an aspiring entrepreneur who wants to really be doing very well to join a startup with 3,000 employees? And if that is the case, how do you spot whether that's the right one? And the third one is, what <laughs> is your dominant gene? Is it you only get one question. All right, let me... So wait, wait, so hold on. So, so let's just start with at least one question. So yeah. the first question, we're not going to answer three. Xbox the first, culture. yeah. The, the Xbox Let me talk about culture. expert culture because it's it's actually it's actually the most interesting part yeah, of yeah. of those questions. Um, sadly, um, one of the things I can be very objective about about my own performance on the Xbox business is that I didn't think about culture anywhere close to enough. If if I had to pick. If I was starting a company today and I had to pick two or three things that mattered the most, yeah, culture is on the list. Yes. It's on the list with technology, it's on the list with ideas. It's, it's right up front. Um, at some level, uh, you know, I can make the argument it's the most important. And, and that's probably taking it to a bit of an extreme. Our culture on Xbox for the first four or five years was a function of who we hired and no, nothing more than that. And since we hired people from the systems group, we hired people from the hardware team, we hired people from office, we hired people from the gaming community, it was a mess. And there was no culture. And it was, or it was, as I said, the United Nations. And it wasn't until we said we're gonna define the culture and write principles and force people to think about it that way that we got disciplined about the culture. And in fact, some senior people left, important people opted out. They said, that's not the place I want to work. And that was bad for us in the short term and fabulous for the team in the long term because we were able to start to work as a team. We went from being an incredibly talented group of individuals who kind of got the first version launched based on sheer energy and intellect. And there were some, there's some were amazing people to a uh, a really good team. It's the difference between watching an NBA All-Star game, which is just an awful piece of basketball, <laughs> but you see a lot of good players, and then watching the San Antonio Spurs play, which has less talent than most teams in the NBA, and has a reasonable shot at winning the NBA title. And to me, that's what culture is, um, and it's incredibly powerful and important. How many people were there? Uh, on Xbox, when we start, when we started in December of uh, '99, so January 2000, there were 25 people on the project. By the time we shipped Xbox, the first version, they're probably close to 2,000. So that's in 18 months. So just think about that for a moment. <clears throat> you know, how many startups go from 20 to 1,800 in 18 months? I mean, they just don't. Um, but you know, we could hire lots of people in Microsoft. Sure. Right? And I mean, it wasn't, you didn't need a recruiter. Yeah, exactly. Jay, Jay's favorite strategy was to go say, I'm going to go give a presentation on what we're doing to another group. And people would come and watch, and then they'd all apply for jobs. Yeah. It was great. <laughs> and you'd hire 10 or 15 people at a time. It was, yeah, totally. it was, it was, a, yeah. it was a good strategy. Yeah, yeah. Question? Yeah. Yeah, Robbie, I something you, I'm sorry, was that me? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. So I was hoping you'd expand on something you said earlier that I thought was really interesting. You talked about how you're a believe in people. Yeah. And one thing you've learned is to have less patience with people. Right. Can you maybe give some tips, you know, things we can hang our hat on, specific things when you know you've got too much patience and you need to have less? Well, here's the, here's the, here's the thing. So you hire somebody for a job and you say, um, okay, I've hired this person. I think it's a good hire. I think they can do the job, but they've got this set of weaknesses. And you've got to, the, the first thing you got to do when you hire somebody who you know has strengths and weaknesses is you got to have the hard talk with them about their weaknesses. You have to sit down and say, look, these are the things that are your strengths, your superpowers. I'm excited about them. That's what's going to make you successful. But you got these things that, from my process of interviewing, that I think are going to be real challenges in what you have to do. And the litmus test is does the person listen? Do they take it seriously? And do they try to make progress on those things? And um, that's a hard test for people. It's, you know, think of it this way. Your first conversation with the startup leader of your company is what you're bad at. 
Um, it's a really hard conversation to have. But you have to do that conversation in the context, look, I hired you because I expect you to be successful. I'm making a big bet. This is important. We have 10 people at the company. You're number 11. That means you're whatever that is, 9% you know, yeah. of the resource exactly. at the company. So, oh my gosh, you better be good. And so I've got to look at the places where I see you have weaknesses and be really straightforward with it. And you have to be strong enough as an individual to accept that feedback and say, you're right, I gotta get better. And you will instantly know how people take that feedback. And some people say, verily I get it, and they'll go work on it, and you'll see the progress and see the change. Some people will say, verily yes, and you'll see no change, and you'll see no effort, and that's what I call the pocket veto. That is a bad sign. Um, and then there's some people who just don't get it, and who are offended by it. And then you've probably not made the right hire. Um, so, and that's a, I don't literally mean the first meeting, but that's the conversations that you have to be able to have with people when you bring them on board and, and you're working with them. Is you gotta be able to have those sort of truthful conversations. I, the guy who is the CEO at Sonos is a guy named John McFarlane. And he is the true believer. He is in the dictionary next to transparency. And sometimes in, in ways that just scare the crap out of me. Um, because he's just really honest with people. And he's an engineer by training, but a good people person. And you know, a couple years ago, I'd been with, working with the company for about two years. They hired a guy in product management, and after three months, John knew that the fit wasn't right. And the guy hadn't moved his family. He literally went and had a conversation with him, says, you and I both know this isn't gonna work, and here's why. And the guy said, you're right, and moved back to the valley. It's the right for the thing for the guy, right thing for, for Sonos. Being able to have those kinds of conversations is hard, but you gotta be able to do it. It's a real test of being a people manager and being somebody who cares deeply about people, which I do, and yet caring enough to have the honest conversations. It's hard. One more question, guys. Does Sonos have any plans, sorry, me? Yeah. Sure, Does go Sonos ahead. Does Sonos have any plans to uh, integrate some sort of like Cortana or Siri type service? <laughs> uh, it's a good question. Um, you know, if they did, I couldn't tell you, because um, that would be proprietary information. Um, the thing they've done to date, which is in some ways the most powerful, if you're a real music lover, one of the most powerful things they've done, is they have cross-service universal search. So it's text-based today, so it's not Cortana. But the idea that I can be a user of Spotify and uh, have my own library on a hard drive and be a user of Deezer and have all those services on Sonos and do a search and have it pull up music from all the different services and find the song is very cool. And so search and discovery, to get at the underlying part of your question, search and discovery, hugely important. When you have all the world's music, hmm. but it's not completely at your fingertips and it's hard to find, that's tough. And so one of the things they do focus on is figuring out how you work across all those services to get things done. Turns out most people have more than one service. Um, almost everybody has Pandora plus one. And then there's people who have Pandora plus two, three, and four. It's actually not uncommon. Um, and then when you throw YouTube in there, which is you know second largest music service in the United States, which is weird, but it is. Um, you know, figuring out how you sort through all that data is actually really important. Cool space. Any more questions? <laughs> Sorry, no, just, just joking, no, really. Uh, one more question, I'll just give you the hand up right there. Yeah, with the thumb up, go. Yeah. So for startups, what should we be looking for in board members? You're talking about the school boards, what should we be looking for? Um, there's no perfect answer for that. Let me answer it this way. Um, in every company, when you look at the team, uh, I use this analogy when I talk about leadership. And people ask, so what's the most important attribute to be a great leader? And I tell people, well, there isn't one attribute. Everybody, it's sort of like thinking through the Avengers. Um, each of the Avengers has a superpower. 
And your challenge as a leader is finding your superpower and then surrounding yourselves with people who have different superpowers so that collectively yes. you're, you're better than individually. Yeah. And so I think of boards the same way. Um, so you have to think, okay, what things do we have inside the company that are where we're really talented and you know, where we, you know, we don't need help? And what places do we need help? And how do I find board members who are willing and able to fill that superpower need. Now, some board members you're gonna get because they funded you and the price of funding was a board member. <laughs> and in that case, your conversation with them is not are they a board member, but who from the, from, the, from the company is the board member and what role do you ask them to play? And I'd encourage you, even though it's uncomfortable, to have that conversation with them. If they come to your board, if you, know, if you got a venture capitalist or an angel who's funding you and is on your board, you have to tell them what you expect from them. And, and the good ones actually want you that. And the good they ones want, want you to do that. Yeah, yeah. They really will, do want you to do that. And so I think of your board as um, an extra asset. And how do I fill it with people who don't, aren't just names, but people who have a specific role? Why am I on the Sonos board? Why did John McFarlane ask me to be on the Sonos board? Because a whole bunch of the things that we went through on Xbox, Sonos goes through. They're a software company. They're a hardware company. They're a retail company. They're trying to figure out how to integrate all those things. They're in the entertainment space. So in the sales marketing operation space, when I joined, they, didn't, they had just hired a CMO, they had no head of sales, and they had no head of operations. And so my superpower for them was helping them navigate through those waters. And it turns out the problem doesn't go away. Even when you hire the people, there's still more things. And so the time, I spend most of my time with the head of sales and marketing at Sonos. We talk once a week. Um, and that's what you want from a board member. And you want to be able to give them the flexibility to talk to your employees. So if you're the CEO and you have somebody who's good in finance on your board, you want them to have the direct line to who's ever managing finance for you and to not feel like they have to go through you because you want your finance person to get the benefit of their expertise. Um, I think oftentimes people think of boards as governance things or they think of things where they're filling slots or names they want to put on their slide deck. If you're doing that, you, you're doing it for all the wrong reasons. You want people there who are going to add value to your company and you should demand that from them. It's an interview just like you interview anyone else. It is. It, 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 it totally is. And sometimes, sometimes people think, well, they're interviewing me about whether they want to invest. In fact, you have to decide whether you want them to invest because of what they can add to your company. Um, and that's a, to me, that's the difference between a value-added VC and somebody who's just trying to make a buck on your idea. And that's an important distinction. Well, Robbie, thank you very much. Cool. That was fun. Yeah. Enjoyed it. Yeah, thanks, Good man. to see you. Yeah.